All right, this is going to be a follow-up video to my video last night to Anarcho Pack. Um, I don't know if he is planning or, or has made a video response, but he left several comments uh, on his video. I brought up a couple of points, several of, of which I think are, are pretty uh, worth going into. Uh, you know, the video I made to him, I made several critiques of democracy egalitarianism, but by no means comprehensive. And some of the comments that he made kind of invite... Um, exploring some other problems that I have uh, with his caricature of the world. Before I get into that, though, I just want to know that uh, note that uh, Ned Stark is right for once. We're getting our first significant snowfall, which is cool. I spent last winter in West Virginia, and there really wasn't a winter, so this is kind of nice. So, uh, he made about seven comments, and I should reply to each of them. About ten minutes apiece, I think, should do it. Um, now, he says, I said many times in my three-part video series, and by the way, I only watched the first part, and in the description on these videos, that ANCAPs advocate decentralized state states consented to via market transactions, uh, without government control, so it's not just that they are funded differently. Well, based on that comment, the fact that they're consented to explicitly through market transactions actually makes them fundamentally different than the way states are now, because states are not based on uh, market consent or any consent whatsoever. They claim that there is implied consent, but this is extremely vapid. You know, you were born in a society, you haven't fled, that sort of thing. Hence, you are consenting or it's voluntary, and there's no other... That's not a valid basis for uh, a contractual exchange and for anybody other than the state. So this goes back to my my view that the state is more of a hypocrisy when it comes to um, exchange than, than a territorial monopoly, although that's usually part of that hypocrisy. Um, if you have states many state and again he doesn't you're not at, at no point in your comments do you address my claim that look if you have a, a commune a communist controlled factory uh and you get attacked are you going to defend yourself and if so isn't that a monopoly on violence on a given territorial area whether that be a democratic run commune or not it's still a territorial monopoly on violence so i don't see how you know my willingness to defend my home or my business whether individually or through contractual agreement with a defense form, firm or a militia is somehow statist, but if uh, your anarcho-syndicalist community gets attacked and you defend yourself, well, that's not statist, we're not statist then. I don't, your comment doesn't address that. I think that's the fundamental hypocrisy in your slander of anarcho-capitalists when you say they're statists for wanting to defend property when, unless you're going to do that, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, maybe you're a pacifist and you think if you get attacked, you, you shouldn't do anything, or you think that in an anarcho-syndicalist system there will never be violence, there will never be disputes about property, there will never be assaults or any kind of war or anything, and everyone will get along fine. Um, you know, in which case, sure, then that doesn't, then that's that's another difference with anarcho-capitalism, and I think that's a kind of a silly assumption to base your, your worldview on. It's kind of like saying, what if everyone is unanimous and everyone agrees, then everything will be fine. Okay, that's true, but um, that's not a very good assumption to have. Um, you know, if you have a society that, if defense services are based on market transactions, voluntary ones, not implied contracts, social contracts like we have with states now, uh, the incentives are completely different. Uh, if there's no, and, 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 you know, the main um, boon to the state is an ideological one. People think that they have to have the government they have to have the state or else we'll all become homicidal maniacs or we'll become vulnerable. Um, and so that gives them an enormous amount of leeway. Not total leeway. They can't do literally anything. There are limits. It depends on the society and it depends on the state. They can't do anything. But they can do a lot more because of the ideological support of statism. You know, the idea that, well, maybe we're bad, but we're a necessary evil. That's a real, real common um, justification. And that is not some intrinsic human function to have a state. That is a, a an ideological 
position that most places in the world today have share. But uh, the reason I say it's not intrinsic is because throughout history there have been examples of societies that lack states. So clearly, you know, either they were genetically different to people or, or uh, it's not innate. And also the, deg the, the scope of states around the world today varies quite a bit. You know, uh, Americans tend to put up with a lot less, especially a lot less, especially in terms of a domestic state than, say, Europeans do. Um, not all Europeans, but you know. So the fact that it varies to me indicates that it's not some set uh, uh, evolutionary precondition. I mean, states, in terms of the evolution of humans, are a relatively new phenomenon. So uh, it's it's an ideological. Um, problem and that's you know the whole point of me making uh, YouTube videos the whole point of um, dis dispersing libertarian ideas is to change that ideology and you know it's we're in a good possession you know Europe Europe had um, totalitarian states in the sense that there was no rights of individuals you know the king owned everything and then when the kings got to place displaced you know the the new states that instead of uh, the divine authority they claimed you know democratic hegemony uh, could do anything also and in the United States we had a lot more minarchism where people said okay the government's allowed to do X Y and Z and that's it and that has eroded enormously in the last intervening 200 years but uh, you know that, that's an indication that it can change but going back um, a market system you know it's, if it's going to be based on market transactions, it's not going to be based on some kind of religion that you have to have a defense agency. And as I said in my video, I think most people are not going to be the customers of a defense agency. Because I think in the United States, because this is the society I'm most geared towards changing, um, most places are not at high risk of, of violent assault. And what they are at risk at is something that an individual is likely to take care of. So, you know, growing thorn bushes in front of your windows, getting a padlock, and maybe getting a shotgun or a rifle is more than enough for most people. In fact, most people probably don't even need that. And then the, some areas where maybe there's a little bit more risk, then uh, they'll probably form militias. They'll call their enablers and they'll be like, "Hey, I'll call you. You call me." Uh, if there's and, and people respond to you know what the demand is. If you live in an area and there's you know Mexican drug cartels, which there wouldn't be obviously if there's no state in the United States, because then there'd no be no black market in drugs. But uh, you know, let's say say roving bands of Mexican pirates or let's say overzealous Canadian troops who want to extend uh, bring, bring the benefic their beneficence to to bordering areas of anarcho America um, you know then there's suddenly an incentive to have more organization more capital invested more resources invested in in, in defense and people will start um, pooling their resources whether in some kind of collective arrangement like a militia or through a firm to buy you know whatever weaponry whatever capital is most attuned to uh, preventing incursions that you know that's going to vary if you live on an island you're probably going to want to have anti-ship stuff if you live uh, in some mountain pass in the middle of the continent uh, you probably aren't going to need uh, anti-ship things um, you know so what what exactly people get how exactly they organize is is kind of um, you know, we can speculate, but we can't really predict. Uh, but that, since it's, the, the being based on voluntary fundamentally changed the incentives. You know, the state's going to get your tax money whether you agree or don't agree with how they're providing your defense. So uh, the government right now does not have to worry about, geez, do most people think the war in Iraq is a good idea? Well, you know, cause, because if they don't think it's a good idea, they might withhold their funding. They don't have to even worry about that. Uh, whereas a private defense firm or a militia would absolutely have to worry about that. If they say, hey, uh, we need to raise your rates a hundred percent because we want to invade, you know, Ontario or whatever. Um, maybe some of their customers are like, yeah, I want, I've always wanted to invade Ontario. So they'd still support it. And others very likely would say, look, I got, I'm paying you so that my house doesn't get attacked, not so that you can take over Toronto. So, you know, I'm, I'm withdrawing my money. Uh, so the incentives are completely different. I think you are still engaging in equivocation and hypocrisy because you're um, you're not a, you're not addressing the point. I'm not. I mean, you made no no mention of it in the comments about you know what is an anarcho-syndicalist system going to do when it gets assaulted? Nothing. If the answer is it's going to use force, then 
your then the equivocation you used against and caps would equally apply to whatever system you're talking about. So, uh, Jason, I, I was joking when I said ten minutes per comment, but that's that's what's happening. Uh, let's see. The state protects the interests of the ruling class, be they capitalists or USSR bureaucrats. The government is, but not always, e.g., e North Korea, accountable to popular democratic struggle, e.g., civil rights movements or women's movements or anti-war movements. Hence, why under neoliberalism corporations are hence why under neoliberalism corporations are wonderful and government is awful because government government is accountable in a way that a corporation isn't. All right. I agree that government is accountable in a way that corporations are not, but I think that, that way is actually less accountable. So, yes, we can vote, we can agitate uh, for the government to change its policies, but it is uh, immeasurably more difficult to accomplish change and to influence the government in that way than it is companies. Even today, even the corporations that we have today are easier to affect than the government. Let's just say, for instance, just randomly, that I don't like the Iraq war, the war in Afghanistan, the soon-to-be war in Syria, Libya, uh, Somalia. I don't like giving money to foreign dictators or anybody. I don't like the money that's given to Israel. You said you uh, like Noam Chomsky, so you should appreciate that I think it's absolutely atrocious that I be taxed to give um, the warmongers in Israel, all the weapons they could possibly need for whatever diabolical plots they're hatching against their neighbors, on and on and on and on. And I am allowed to vote. I, I have the right to vote in the United States. That right has not been taken away from me. And so uh, I can vote. We have free speech. So I can, uh, I can try and end the wars by at, uh, advocating that they be end. I can lead protest marches. I mean, I totally have free speech. We can make picket signs. Uh, I can call my representatives. I can try and get things on the ballot. There's a lot. There are lots of things I can do to the government uh, to try and change their mind. But they all are extremely difficult to actually accomplish anything. I could invest all of my money. I could invest all of my time. I could spend all my time going door to door to door, knocking on people's doors. I could make hundreds of YouTube videos as I already have get thousands of, and there are people who do this right now all the time. There are thousands of people who are engaging in at least the amount of activism I'm talking about right now, if not more. And at the end of the day, it's going to come down to an election where the government has, they count the votes, they set the terms of the election, they, they say what can be voted on. And even when the election happens, uh, they are allowed to basically interpret the results. So Obama can win an election and most people who voted for Obama, and this is, I think, literally true, especially when he was elected in 2008, thought that he was going to, quote, end the wars. That's what people were against the wars. They hated Bush. They hated everything that was associated with Bush. And they correctly associated the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan with Bush. And so this was a repudiation of him. And so they voted for Barack Obama. Barack Obama can then simply say, oh, everyone voted for me. That means that whatever I want to do is what the people are endorsing. So... Uh, he continued all the wars, the uh, fake withdrawal from uh, Iraq, a totally fallacious claim, which, by the way, isn't even his doing. That's a, a treaty that Bush had signed. Uh, he doesn't have to do any of that. He's actually attacked more countries. He continues drone strikes, and he can just say, look, that's what the voters want because they voted for me. So all that, and there was an enormous amount of just, I went to, we're talking millions of people who were agitating at all levels to try and affect that change, and they didn't get any of it. They got none of it. Now let's say that I don't like a certain company. I can't vote in that company. I mean, unless you become a shareholder, which is easy to do, but not all companies are shareholders. So, I mean, most of them are, but some, some of them are. But, uh, you know, you don't have much of a vote, although you have more than you do with the government. You know, if you have five shares in a company with 10 million shares, and you have a lot more say than, say, voting for the president. But... If I don't like what a company is doing, forget boycotts and all that, which of course is perfectly po possible. I have to, all I have to do is say, you know what, I don't want to fund them, so I'm just not going to I'm not going to patronize them. You know how hard it is. Uh, like I say I don't want to fund the Iraq War, so I'm going to try and make it so the government doesn't. I'm going to keep my tax money for that. You know how hard that is. We, you can. There are people who waste their entire lives attempting to get the government to change a policy like that, and they fail. 
Every once in a while, one of them will succeed. In the meantime, everybody's forced to pay. And if you don't pay, if I decide, you know, I'm just not going to send them a check for the money that they, uh, you know, I, maybe I believe in X, Y, and Z, but not uh, 1, 2, and 3. So I'm going to deduct the cost of 1, 2, and 3 from my, my income tax or my sales tax, which of course I can't, I don't even have a say on, and all the other taxes that are just uh, included in the, the stuff I buy. But let's just think about income taxes here for a second. If I if I just say, oh, I'm paying you half because half your budget's for bullshit I don't believe in, they're going to come to me and they're going to, a SWAT team is going to come to my house eventually, break down the door. Uh, if I'm not asleep, which is probably the case, uh, and I try and stop them because they're attacking me, they'll kill me. Uh, and if they don't kill me, they'll throw me in prison and you know they'll seize all my assets. If I don't like what a company is doing, I just stop buying their stuff and I don't have to give them a dime. I don't have to convince anybody else. This is the thing. So with politics, you just have to, you don't get your way unless you can convince everybody. But in a free market, the neoliberal thing that you just so giddy at pointing out that you don't get to vote, you don't have to convince anybody. Just the a couple of weeks ago, me and my coworker were went out to lunch in, in 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 a town in Colorado. We were going off to work, and I was like, "Where do you want to go?" He's like, "I want to go to Jimmy John's." So we went to Jimmy John's, and they and they put mustard on his sandwich, which he did not want. And guess what? We will never, ever, ever go to that Jimmy John's ever again. It was that easy. We didn't have to lead a civil rights movement that takes decades and millions of dollars in our entire life that might affect some change, but really more likely is just going to give political power to some politician who will use our passion and our rhetoric to justify whatever it is is in their agenda, which is what you're really talking about. That's the effect of what you're talking about. All the all the passion and working, all that does is legitimize the state. It legitimizes any politician who wants to use that rhetoric to advance. And this sounds like some if, if this sounds like some kind of anti-government, anti-democratic bias that's just totally polluting my thought process, then you need to look at the way things are right now because this is exactly how every politician in every country acts. All of them. Any widespread social movement and that's incredibly difficult to to make happen they are just going to harness that enthusiasm that passion and they're going to couch whatever it is they do in those terms and all you've done is given them more power all the civil rights movement did was give the federal government more power on on the presumption that it can do good and and the result of the civil rights movement which is based on real thing there were real concerns all that means now is the federal government will dismiss anybody who opposes its power. This is what happens in the United States right now. Anybody who opposes the federal government, the federal government will say, you're racist, you want to kill black people and burn crosses in their yard and lynch them. And because anybody who is against our power, they're against the civil rights movement, which the point of the civil rights movement was to give the government power. That's the effect. So... When you say that they're accountable in a way others are not, you're right. That you can vote and you can politically politically agitate. It's extremely difficult. You don't get very good results. Um, they're not very precise results. You can advocate for a particular change. And after a lifetime of, of political activism, there might be a change, but it will be very unlikely that's exactly what you're looking for. In all probability, in almost all cases, your passion, your desire to change the system is only going to... Uh, increase its power, increase its rhetorical might, increase people's uh, dependence upon it. They want to be the solution to the problems of the world, and you're just playing into that in a very naive way by thinking, "Oh, if we have a problem, you know, we should agitate with the government." No, if you don't like, if if you if you're walking around Walmart and you just don't like the way things are there for whatever reason, you don't, maybe you don't like the products, maybe you don't like how they treat their workers, maybe you don't like the color of the sign, you just never have to go there ever again. That's as easy as it is. You don't have to subsidize them. And this is the, the problem with the state is you have to subsidize them whether you like it or not, whether the majority of people like it or not. It totally, totally different orders of magnitudes of how much they can be influenced. Companies are very susceptible to this. They are very concerned about how they are perceived. You know, if they think that they're going to lose customers, they will change policy instantly. And even if they don't, you have the right the very easy ability to simply withhold your support. You know, I don't think boycotts are particularly effective. 
but you don't have to subsidize none of your money which is something we don't have i can't say that none of my money goes to the iraq war and killing people and helping israel because money is fungible and it goes to the united states government and you know if i try and not do it they're gonna come and arrest me which is something no no neoliberal corporation has ever done will ever do can ever accomplish uh so yeah you're technically right it is it is accountable in a way corporations are aren't but it's also far 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 less accountable on net than any company even the corporations we have today which are not on a free market which have restricted competition you know so they don't have as you don't have as many alternatives as you otherwise would uh, in this system as opposed to a free market system even today you have it's not infinitely but many orders of magnitude more influence over a company than you will ever have you know over over a over the state i don't care democratic what's the whatever um for this this comment to you from you i mean this is what the sauce is talking about when you have this cartoonish belief you know this is the myth that gets per, uh, perpetuated in the public schools by the by the uh, media the hollywood they always like to have make these inspiring movies about this or that person who you know campaigned for the government to, to have the government change some in, iniquity within the world, you know, and then they're, they're succeeding. And even when you get what you want, the government's still going to use all that passion to just uh, perpetuate its own iniquity. I like I like. there's a story out there. Uh, there's a documentary out there. Oh, gosh, what was it called? It's about... It's about how corn is in all the food, and it's because there's a, you know, a farm lobby, and they got the government to say that you have to have grains or whatever. Anyway, and it, and it's advocate, it advocates like organic farming and all that, which, by the way, the government tries to prevent. The biggest organic farmers in the United States are all libertarians. But they they did a, they, they had two stories in there. One woman whose son, um, he ate food from uh, like Walmart or something, and it was FDA approved. It was something that the government had inspected and said is safe. And he had a very negative reaction. I believe he died from it. It's like a four-year-old kid. And she went and spent the rest of her life... Um, so far, this is not that long ago, so it wasn't her entire life, but several years, and she's probably still doing it, attempting to get the law changed to reflect this particular little thing. And, you know, she goes, spends all of her time, all of her money. Uh, she goes and has meetings with legislatures who are very patronizing, like, oh, I really care. We'll see what I can do, you know, but then they never really do anything. Nothing has changed because of all of her efforts. Then on the other hand, they show these hippie, liberal, communist guys in California where they were upset that they, they would go to Walmart and there was no organic food and they thought this was dumb. So what did they do? Did they go to the government? They launch a campaign? You know, I mean, according to you, that's the best thing to do. They're, they're receptive, right? No, they decided, well, we're just going to start our own organic farm. So they did. And we'll sell to people who want to buy our produce. And they started doing that. And now they are both millionaires. Not only are they just millionaires, which is great for them, they've been providing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people with a good or service that they value, not only the producers, I mean, the guys who did it are big on organic farming. Obviously, their customers are as well. And next thing you know, Walmart's knocking on their door asking, okay, how, like, lots of customers want this. So, you know, it was funny because they had showed the meeting, these two guys. I wish I could remember the name of the documentary. Anybody knows what I'm talking about, put the name of the documentary in the comments because it was a surprising documentary because I think the people who made it are like socialists, but... But when you look at it realistically, you can't support. Anyway, it was funny because they're having an interview with, you know, Walmart has these procu uh, guys who go around and procure, you know, supplies for them. And it was, these guys were basically, these organic farmers were reading these guys the riot act. Like, we hate you, blah, 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 corporations, blah, 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 greedy profit. You guys feed shit. And you know what the guy, the Walmart guy says, I don't care what you think about me. I don't care. Well, you can call me whatever you want. We we have to provide our customers what they want. If we don't do, people want organic stuff for whatever reason now. And if we don't provide them, they're going to go to somebody else, and that's business we've lost. So you can call me whatever you want, but Walmart wants to sell your product. And so, how much money do you want to get? You know, like, and they, they were already worth like forty million dollars before this even happened. So that is change. That is accountability. That is control. That's something that you never get 
through the government. And for you to believe that is to have swallowed every little ounce of propaganda you were fed in your government-controlled school, on your government-controlled television, and all your dumb-ass media people who uh, believe in the government like it's... And, and then I'm a statist. <laughs> yeah. Sorry if I got impassioned there. Okay, but let's go to the next comment. Let's see, what's the time? That's well, 25, so that would took 15 minutes on that comment. I, I don't think the other ones are going to be as good. Uh, then the next comment, as someone who reads too much Chomsky, I agree with your points about U.S. military. I don't think that the ANCAP Society would have a military with Walmart sticker, as most people don't have the spare few trillions to fund it. That's, that's correct. I can't argue with that. In my second video, I correct the Army point, but still think that ANCAPs advocate law enforcement of of this law by police, just that they are consented to via private property of what you purpose. Well, that's a big difference. That totally changes the incentives. Uh, it's decentralized. It, it's not the same thing. Uh, but I also want to point out about law. This is, you know, my views. There, there's kind of two views on on anarcho-capitalist law. You've got you've got the Murray Rothbards of the world, and I consider myself a Rothbardian. I think he's the greatest political philosopher, whatever. But he wasn't right about everything. And kind of the idea with those libertarians is there's some kind of, a, sort of like objectivism, is that there's some kind of objective law, libertarian law, if you want to call it, call, um, call it that, which is actually not that dissimilar from the developed common law that we kind of inherited from Britain. And that that's what the law is going to have to be. You're going to have to have, you know, some, you know, like Hammurabi law code and libertarianism. And, you know, everyone's going to live by that. And I think... Uh, that's not impossible. It is conceivable that you have a society that has a very clearly understood legal order and doesn't have a state, and yet has polycentric law. You had you had this in Somalia. You had this in um, in the most the most famous example among libertarians. The one and the one I'm most familiar with is the Icelandic common law, Commonwealth, where you didn't have a state, and that's there's no there is. Everybody who ever studies Iceland, and these are not just libertarians, just people who study it, the the free state period in Iceland, there was no state in Iceland, but it was a very litigious society. Uh, there was a very clear legal order that was uh, in place and practiced, and uh, there was a famous explorer who uh, from Baden, uh, Germany, who visited there and said, in Iceland, there is no law, or there is no king but the law. Uh, so that is possible. I tend to think that is less likely. I think law uh, needs to arise from uh, uh, dispute resolution that it has to come, a body of law has to develop through arbitration, basically. So uh, just a as it develops, let's just say uh, I live out in the woods, I have my own plot of land, and, you know, I, and I live there, and nobody at any point ever uh, disputes my property. No one comes and says, hey, I own part of this or I own part of that. There's never a dispute. Is there any law in that situation? No. You know, what is the law in that situation? We don't know. There's no there's no need for it to exist. But let's say someone moves in next to me and they start to, you know, clear their own area and then I say, hey, listen, that all that woods over there, that's all mine too. Um, now we have a dispute. Now we have a basis for a body of law. And what does that mean is we're going to have to resolve our dispute. And, all, and more than likely, we're going to resolve it between the two of us. I'm gonna, he's going to say, listen, I know, you, I know you really like this valley, uh, but I need a place to stay. Um, I don't want to infringe on the, on the land that you've cleared and cultivated or built a factory on or whatever. Just We're using hypotheticals here. Uh, but th this bit of virgin woods here, you haven't done much here other than maybe walk through it a couple times or put a birdhouse or something. And uh, I'll give you the birdhouse back, but... You know, uh, I really, I really feel like I, I need this land pretty bad. You're not, you haven't invested very much in it, if anything, you know, and, and we can hash it out. And if, and if I say, if I, I most likely in, in the, in the scenario that I've just outlined, I'd probably say, yeah, that's fine, whatever, go ahead, uh, give me the birdhouse back and maybe bring me a, a bowl of cookies or whatever, whenever you're done, we'll call it good. Or I might say, Hey, no, you know, this entire valley is mine from sea to shining, shining sea or everything that I can view survey from the top of my tree house is mine. Um, you know, then we have a dispute and we're going to, 
if we can't resolve it um, amongst ourselves between the two of us we'll have to go to a third party arbiter and that arbiter can be a judge or it can be you know we can go to a third neighbor we can hire a jury there's a lot there's innumerable potential plausible methods that we could use to figure this out my phone is ringing oh, it doesn't matter so uh yeah telemarketer uh let's wait for it to finish there we go uh and the decision that's reached would and you know we have an incentive to come to uh, We have an incentive to resolve this uh, somehow because if we don't, we'll continue to uh, escalate the the dispute eventually, uh, eventually to the point of physical violence, which is in almost all cases, not literally really all, but almost all cases, something we're not willing to do. And so what happens is, okay, we figure out that dispute, and then maybe a couple months later, uh, you know, he wants to cut down woods right on the edge of my lot. Whatever, we'll start to have disputes about the allocation of resources. These are going to have to be adjudicated. We'll either, in every case, we will either escalate to the point of physical violence, which does not make sense most of the time. It it will happen occasionally, but it's unlikely. Uh, if you have a society with thousands or millions of people. You're going to have thousands or millions of arbitrate, thousands or millions of disputes, and maybe one tenth of one percent, or half of a percent, or maybe one percent are going to escalate into violence. But most of them, ninety nine percent, ninety nine point nine percent, more likely, are going to be resolved either between the two directly, which is going to be the case most of the time, or through some type of arbitration. And through that, a body of law develops, and that's how we hash out in a society what property rights are going to be uh, and you know the explicit what you know where they are going to be and I think uh, it's hypothetically possible that it's like communal property rights will kind of come about but I think that's very 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 unlikely and it doesn't really work on utilitarian grounds that's a separate question but that's my take on it so my my view of the law is not the same as all libertarians who think that there's going to be this not Hammurabi, Rothbardian or Ayn Rand law code that everyone's going to, they're going to have to find a way to make everybody believe. Everyone might end up believing the same thing. It ha it does happen. Uh, but uh, if, if you think that you're going to have to force everyone to believe it, well, I would agree then that is, that is approaching a kind of statism. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about. I think that that is a, uh, a aberration of libertarian theory by those libertarians who have done it. I don't think it's an accurate description of how laws come about. I think the genesis of all law is dispute resolution. That's where common law comes from. Common law does not come from a whole bunch of people getting together and just deciding this is what it's going to be. It has to be based on... The only, the only place where law is even necessary is during disputes. and So that's where it needs to be, de be developed. Not in the classroom, not by academics. They can have a role in the, res in the individual re uh, resolutions themselves. So, you know... I don't think we should have a Rothbardian law code, but if Rothbard was alive and I had a dispute with my neighbor, I would be inclined to having him be the judge. Uh, but it's a slightly different thing. So I think you might be right about some libertarians in that comment, but not me. Uh, you're also wrong, though, about the equivocation of of if it's a market consent, then that's the same. No, okay. Let's see. I think this is in context of the individuals being the same. Anarcho-communists agree with you on this. We are not all the same. This point doesn't contradict the moral statement that we all deserve to be treated with dignity and be allowed to develop ourselves. Well, dignity is subjective. I don't want to take out garbage. I think it would be beneath me, but other people may not feel that way. I'm not going to say that they're being oppressed because they have agreed to do so. Uh, again, this is your, your personal views, and you're using them to... Um, to pass judgment on the agreements between other other people, I think that that's a pretty high 
pretty high burden, a hurdle that you need to jump, uh, which, you know, you, I mean, you have your own personal views about how workers should be remunerated and, and, and when they're not, then you just say, oh, look, that's, that's wrong. And then you kind of use that as, as uh, fuel for your fire that, oh, look at all the evil things that are happening. I have this worldview and world doesn't match up to this, wor uh, that worldview. And so, uh, uh, that makes the world even, even worse, I guess. I don't know. Uh, should we be allowed to develop ourselves? Absolutely, but that does not mean that we are entitled to the resources of others to do that. So I, you know, I'm a big believer, you know, I don't think people should be forced to work. If you don't want to spend your time working, that's up to you. And in a free market, you have options. You can become your own entrepreneur. You can become your own capitalist. You can homestead your own little piece of land and you can live on subsistence. I don't think that, I mean, the biggest cause of homelessness is property taxes and the idea that you have to pay rent to the state. And I think that's absolutely atrocious. I think that it keeps people's standards of living very low. It puts people in a, in a position where they can become landless, which is otherwise not possible. We have way, way more land than we have population. I suppose if you're talking about the, the population growth, when you talk about many, many multiples of what we have now, hypothetically, maybe we could want to run on a land. Not really, though, because we just built skyscrapers, but that's a whole other topic. Um, but, you know, I'm all in favor of people who just want to say, I just want to sit in the hammock all day, go fishing and skin deer, whatever. They should be allowed to do that. But they shouldn't be, I shouldn't be forced to subsidize other people. And that's what you're talking about when you're saying, I don't think that remuneration is fair. If you have very low skills, there's nothing you can do that other people value very much, then you can't uh, just say, well, you know, people are only really, you know, people are only willing to pay that person so much for their goods and services. I don't think that's enough. So they should be forced to pay more just to give that person what I deem to be sufficient amount to indulge in their personal development. I think that that is impinging on the personal and de development of the others that you're, that you're expropriating to do that. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think that that's kind of a a very poor justification for the type of wealth redistribution you're considering to be normative, uh, and and it's failing to appreciate how much liberty uh, an anarcho capitalist society would would allow people. Um, you're free, but you're not free to expropriate from others. The supposed evil of capitalists, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's not it's not evil when the majority does it. Okay. Then you say most socialists don't advocate an instant an instance transition. No, no, I spell even worse than you, so I'm not pointing that out. Uh, you don't overnight learn how to self manage. That's true. That's just that's a skill you learn by being part of an activist group or a syndicate or general assembly. Not necessarily. You just learn how to be a voter in a voting block in those cases. We tend to see the struggle for a social society as a training ground for one. Um, I, I don't like this. This is just assuming that you can get to a point where people have. I mean, are, 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 is your argument? Maybe I shouldn't say you're assuming this, but let me ask. Are you are you thinking then that if we just have enough socialist agitation that everyone will actually become egalitarian in the sense of their ability to manage a firm? You know that if we have enough social agitation, that every worker will be will be come to the point where it makes sense for them to have an equal vote. Um, that sounds like what you're trying to get at. Because my point was, look, you know, workers are not. They're, they're not equal, both in their ability and in their inclination to make decisions about the allocation of resources. And this is, seems to be your response. And I, I'm wondering, is it, are you saying that you think, you think that we just need to get to that point where workers are equal in this? And in which case, I think that's impossible. You'll never get to that point because there are just some people like, you know what, you know, after a certain point, after I get a certain amount of remuneration, uh, it's, there's no there, more mental effort to figure out how we're going to run the boilers or pave the driveway or whatever isn't worth it. I'm just not even going to apply. And, and maybe if they, they're in a society where they have to vote, they'll just start, you know, uh, phoning it in, so to speak, when they vote, which is how most people do it now. Even though now there's so much more tied up into a vote, you know, people seem to think, well, if we have direct democracy, suddenly there's way more incentive to make an informed decision. I don't see how that's the case because we'd be voting on relatively mundane things that even if they do affect us, they're not that major. We're on right now, we have the president who is in charge of the government that has wide, widespread 
sweeping powers in every area of existence. And so, you know, who the president is is re relatively significant. And yet most people don't place any kind of effort into how they're going to pick the president. They don't know anything about their policies, their personalities, anything. They can't compare and contrast the president with the other alternatives. And yet uh, they're going to be really knowledgeable suddenly on whether they should have fluorescent lighting or not in their factory. I, I mean, maybe, I don't know if you're assuming that or, or what, but uh, the other thing here, I think there's a real strong tendency to try and um, force the collective ownership model thing, and I think that uh, it's just totally unnecessary and without, there's no reason to assume that it's so great that we got to jump through all these hoops to get it. Uh, I think you made another comment that all comes back to that, so I'll, I'll let's see. Uh, I'm not responding to the Democratic points as I need to give it a think over before I reply as I have the problem of being an individualist and a communist, so have two views on democracy. Okay, fair enough, and I, you know, but I didn't even begin to raise all the problems I have with democracy. And here's one that I really kicked myself for not mentioning. The idea that it's that it engenders egalitarianism, and again, I don't believe in egalitarianism, but the idea that it does is totally fallacious. That within democracy, you have you will have, and this is direct democracy or representative democracy, both. Uh, you will have people who will have influence, whether that's because they're really persuasive and thought-provoking, like, say, Noam Chomsky, or because they're a silver-tongued liar and manipulator, as is the case with uh, nearly all politicians in the world today. Not literally all, but nearly all. You're going to have people who control voting blocks, de facto, de jure, one way or the other, that have influence that far, far exceeds uh, their one vote. Uh, and so it is erroneous to kind of pretend that a democratic system means an egalitarian system. You will you will have people who will control bo voting blocks. All right. And and this is going to translate into true political hegemony by an elite. It always has every time. There are any historical examples to the contrary. Even anarcho-syndicalist Spain was not without a hierarchy. Uh or, and I don't know if they do this in the UK. In the United States, the whole panacea is, you know, Sweden and Norway. Look, Sweden and Norway is not egalitarian. They have people in their government who have far, far, far more power than the the voter does by virtue of his single casting ballot. Uh, and I know that you don't probably, you probably don't advocate the socialist system because it's not anarchist, but there is no basis, none, for the assumption that direct democracy or workers in a factory when I worked in a store I'm a smart guy I have a pretty good tongue I'm able to be very very persuasive I can convince people to do things that they would not normally do especially when my coworkers aren't particularly intelligent which I'm sorry to say is often the case so to think that if my Burger King had suddenly been plunged uh, into a, a worker run thing that we'd all just become equals is totally fallacious and and you say well we're gonna have training or whatever that that only can go so far you know that can't I, I would agree that that could change it some but at the same time that everyone else is learning to become a little bit less retarded in their voting those who wish to manipulate them are coming up becoming that much better at manipulating them you know the the process of becoming president of the United States is a glorious example of that. They they work through the ranks. First, they get elected to local things. They figure out lies and persuasion that's enough to convince, you know, the little town halls or whatever. And then they get more sophisticated lies to get state office and so forth. And by the time they're serious contenders to the president, they're basically made out of Teflon. Um, they can make the stuff that comes off their tongue sound good to everybody. The best president, by the way, I've ever seen this is Bill fucking Clinton. That guy is an amazing liar. Just incredible. He puts the other guys all to shame. I hate his guts. I think he's a mass murderer. I think everything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. And yet, I can almost be persuaded by the motherfucker sometimes. That's what it, That's what democracy gives you. And, that, and, and they end up being the people who are in charge, not Noam Chomsky. You know, the earnest people... There's always going to be a lie that's going to sound better than the truth. 
Uh, and so the people who are really good at doing that are going to be the people who are in charge. I don't care if it's representative democracy or direct democracy. They're going to be the people who are going to be in charge. There is no historical basis for coming to any other conclusion, and there is no theoretical reason to assume otherwise unless you're just going to say, well, I'm going to somehow make it so everyone in the electorate is perfectly knowledgeable, perfectly objective, totally reasonable, totally incorruptible, then it won't happen. Okay, well, that's an unreasonable assumption, but that's the one you're going to need to make to overcome my objection here. Unless there's some other, I mean, maybe I'm, that's a false dichotomy, but that's the way I see it. Uh, let me say it's from. I, I mentioned that he doesn't have a lot of uh, experience being a worker, which is ironic for all of his rhetoric. Uh, it's for a number of. It's from a. He, so this is him saying where he gets his knowledge. It's from a number of sources: blogs, news, books, history books, and discussions with friends and family, to name a few. Well, you know, I have. I've read blogs. I have the news. I have a whole bunch of books, probably more than you. Although they'd be, and mo many of them are about economics and. The rest are about history, and I have friends and family that I discuss it with. And in addition to all of that, I also have been in the workforce. I'm not particularly old, but I got a job in 2000, so that's been about 12 years. I worked in a couple different fields, not the most. It hasn't been like I've worked in radically different areas, but I've worked in one, two, three, four, five states, five or six states. Uh, and I've, like I said, I've been in low skills. I'm in upper skills now. I've made transitions to different jobs. Uh, I have pretty much always worked full time or more. So, you know, my, my work has always been pretty intense. And for more than half the time I've been employed, I've been extremely explicitly interested in labor, in capitalism, in free markets, in the employee employer exchange. Uh, the last couple jobs I had all explicitly I got them with free market rhetoric um, not explicitly but um, if they knew what they were listening for overtly in my speech uh, so I've been looking at this stuff critically like when I had this this thing happen a year ago where I got all my raises and stuff I exactly knew what was going on on terms of the uh, you know high, theoretical interplay between worker and employee and whatnot and uh, that's a huge advantage in my understanding of it compared to yours I don't care how many blogs you read um, until you are out in the workforce I think that it's way too ivory tower uh, and that's part of the reason I think it's so 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 cartoonish you know and I'm not saying that workers have infinite uh, you know bargaining power because they certainly don't and I think I'm going to address this in your final uh, comment let's see uh, oh, okay. You have two more. This one will be short. Uh, this is based on the fall. This is a comment about he he timestamped these, and I, I didn't write them here. But uh, I mentioned that he's a philosophy student. This is based on the false assumption that I choose to do philosophy because I because of career prospects. I choose it because it's one of the things that I that I enjoy doing the most, and I'm good at. I want to either become a lecturer or any job which an empower is empowering me to pay back my loans or get a low paid job and never pay back my loans okay well fair enough and really we are actually similar in that way because my degree has absolutely nothing to do with my job and uh, is not a, a, a degree that would very in all likelihood ever have caused me to get very high remuneration I have a music degree and unless I became you know best selling high high uh, high demanding clarinet performer that was not likely to pay the bills other than as a teacher which would have required me to work for the government and while I was in college I basically decided I never wanted to do that I became an anarcho-capitalist while I was in college uh, I had been a really strong minarchist when I was in even middle school but I became an anarchist anarcho-capitalist while I was in college and I thought there's no way either for my own moral indignation but even more than that for utilitarian reasons the government is a capricious bitch to be a, a worker for. Uh, I have enough experience with people who do to know that. It seems like it's a good gig until they decide to change the rules on you and then there's nothing you can do. Uh, so I decided this is not going to be a career for me. I got the degree and then I went out and just joined the workforce at the bottom, but I was a good worker. I was an honest worker and with for too long you get to the top of the field that you're in and then you jump to the next field and I'm already at the point again where I'm ready to make another leap into something even better even though the money I make now is more than I can really spend 
Um, and let's see. Da, 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 da. Kudos to you, though. I mean, I, I don't agree with Stefan Molyneux on a lot of things, but I think it's great that he's trying to make a living doing what he loves. And if you want to do that, that's great, too. And if you just want to get a, a something really shitty that pays the bills so you can do philosophy on the side, I have absolutely no problem with that. Uh, but you, you got to understand is people should not be um, forced to subsidize you know, your little life plan, whatever it may be. If you want their resources, you're going to have to get them conditionally, and the condition is going to be an exchange. Um, you can ask. I mean, people can will can donate. You can beg. That's. I mean, people are allowed to do that, and uh, in, in certain circumstances, you know, it's even justifiable. Uh, but if you want, you in in most cases to get enough to to garner enough resources to fulfill most of the demands people have, which is not. I mean, some people have are you know want to be survivalists and live on like a couple pennies a day, and that's fine. But most people want more than that, which is also fine. But they're going to have to offer something for that exchange. And so philosophy typically is not something people are willing to pay very much for. I'll watch Stefan Molyneux's videos, but I'm not willing to give him a dime for them. Uh, and maybe I've bought a couple books about philosophy, but I think the actual profit that would have ended up accruing to the authors, who all of which were dead, so the, that would have been zero. But even if they had been alive, uh, it wouldn't have been very much. Uh, I'm assuming you're going to have to get a job. And the philosophy is probably not going to help any. And if you're fine with that, then it's your life. I mean, fine. I think you should pay back your loans, though. That would be kind of douchey if you didn't do that. I mean, that's a whole other story, though. Um, and then your final point. It's not just wages. It's control over your own work that you have. A member of my family works in banking and is very well paid except that she has no control over her work at the point of getting epileptic fits from the stress and it's possible for workers to improve their wages e.g. through unions or through their employers liking them it's unequal bargaining power not no bargaining power okay firstly the way the way employers tend to see things is they bundle all the costs of the employees together their wages their benefits uh, whatever it costs to train them all that and they don't really care how that's divided. So um, you could go and say, I want 50% of my pay in wages and I want 50% of my pay in health care. They don't care. It's the same cost to them. I mean, if, if you're the only employee who wants health care and them giving you health care would require them to revamp their entire system, then that's a really high cost on their part. But uh, the whole point of employees giving them health care arose because the government fixed wages and the way c companies competed for it for employers because they're set max this is during world war ii they set maximum wages the great glorious government that helps the workers set maximum wages and minimum hours too uh the, they still had to compete for labor because there's competition for labor despite the rhetoric and so the way they did that is by offering perks and the most popular one by far became to offer health care that's a whole other story uh point being uh it's still it's still a negotiation between the two you can't dictate, but that doesn't mean they can do whatever. When I've had low-skilled jobs, when I was going to school, when I was in high school and, and college, you know, when I tell my low-skilled job, listen, these are the hours I'm in class, these are the hours I have band concerts, these are the hours I have to do this, so I need this day off, I need these hours off, they accommodated me. Uh, they couldn't always accommodate everybody. When I was in high school, they really couldn't hire that many high school kids because they didn't need 100 people who all would work after 4 p.m., and be done by you know 9 p.m. They needed people who'd work all hours of the day, so they were only really willing to hire so many high school students because they were their schedule was constricted in such a way. But since I was always a really good worker, I was always one of those high school students, and the same was true when I was in college. Uh, you know, in my in my company now, uh, you know, we have wiggle room where we can talk about how much do I get paid mileage, how good of a hotel, he'll put me up in a hotel when need be. I try not to be an ass about it and just get the nicest hotel and then make him pay for that. He's always done it, but I try and be nice about it. Say, oh, well, I'll get the Econo Lodge, not the Double Tree or whatever. Um, your aunt needs to consider: Is it really worth? I mean, they they may not be in a position where they can offer her something that's that different. You know, a lot of times you have to work certain hours. 
Uh, when I was in telemarketing, you don't do telemarketing at 2 a.m. in the morning. It has to be within certain hours. So if I said, hey, listen, I like this job, but I just want to do it from midnight to 4 a.m., they'd be like, well, you know, we really can't because we don't have no customers, you know. So I don't know the specifics about your aunt or whoever the relative is, but, uh, you know, there is wiggle room, but it's wiggle room. It's not I get to tell them whatever I want. And if she really thinks that the – if she thinks that the – epilepsy is worth it then she continues to do it then you know I don't know what to say if she doesn't think it's worth worth it she should get a different job you know nothing's stopping her from doing that now it's granted uh, the government restricts competition so there aren't as many employers as there otherwise would be and it would be much much harder for her to say start doing it on her own which is you know kind of the well, I don't want to work for a boss you should be able to start your own company the government basically makes that impossible or very 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 difficult It's certainly capital intens intensive for most things not everything but most things which is a travesty and this is where I have sympathy with labor more than just the typical you know, Ayn Rand capitalist or everything blah 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 uh, workers are prevented from acting in this way and of course they're also forced into jobs because of property taxes which you have to pay with money so that forces people to be to have some kind of monetary income you know if there weren't property taxes if you could just own your own land then that wouldn't be necessary you could live out and just eat rabbits and hares and whatever and you wouldn't need to come up with any cash to pay uh, big daddy government uh, but since you do have to do that you have to get weight money somehow and that that induces more people than otherwise would into wage labor. Uh, so I have sympathy in that regard, but, um, you know, it sounds like whatever the job is causes epilepsy, at least for your mom. I probably doesn't, or aunt or whatever, probably doesn't happen for everybody. Uh, there is what is called opportunity cost. She should get another job, probably one that pays less but doesn't cause epilepsy. That's her choice to make. Um, you know, I mean, I, I've worked in high stress jobs before and you know the job I'm in now that was getting really really stressful and I remember one day it was a really bad day I was covered in oil and I was thinking okay this is really bad I would and so I called my boss and I said we need to talk I'm willing to do this but not for what you're paying me and you know what I got a fifty dollar a day raise which is pretty decent and I've been satisfied with that so far you know so not that that can happen all the time to everybody but it can happen that's for her to consider. Now your last point. This I think crucial one. It's unequal bargaining power, not no bargaining power. Firstly, how do you how do you quantify bargaining power? Like how are you measuring that? Like do you have a bargaining power scale that you're able to say, ah, my my aunt has thirty units of bargaining power and the bank has a hundred units of bargaining power. Like you're saying they're not equal, which means you have to have a metric and you don't. Or if you do, you've never said it. I like to hear it. Uh, second, why? What's the what's the basis for assuming that the bargaining power has to be equal? Again, I use the example of G.S. debunked in his business that he spent thousands of pounds on, thousands of his hours in labor and in thought, and then he might hire you because you just want to get a shit job to pay not pay back your student loans after your philosophy degree falls through. Um. Why on earth should you have equal bargaining power with him? That's a legitimate question to me. That you're assuming the answer is you should, based on what exactly? That all man like that, and this is the utilitarian argument against collective ownership of property because what it it is much simpler, much more utilitarian and functional to say private property for individuals what is yours you have a right to dispose with as you see fit as long as you're not aggressing against others and uh, there's no need to try and squeeze the collectivist notions of property ownership onto that uh, in this scenario uh, he's entitled to his property now he needs what at some point he may need workers so he's gonna have to try and induce them he's gonna have to induce them by offering some package of wages or benefits or both or whatever and if they agree to it then I don't care what other people think they've agreed to it they both view it as mutually beneficial it's his company the terms under which you work for him maybe they give you a say in the company maybe they don't maybe he'll respect your opinion maybe he won't but whatever he pays you 
he's agreed to pay you, and the money that he pays you is yours, and then you have control over that. And so I've worked over the years in, in low-income jobs where a lot of the workers were stupid, lazy, drug-addicted, nobodies. But their pay was theirs, and what they used it for was theirs. And if they owned a house, I don't care if it was a shitty trailer or a swampy piece of no-good land, it was theirs. And they had every right to do with it as they saw fit. And I think it is absolutely atrocious and tyrannical even to think that they should have their property put at the disposal of random other people because of some electorate system. You know, I don't. Th I think they should have an unequal say in the disposition of their property that they earned. I'm talking about the workers and the capitalist. You're saying no, 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 no. The the disposition and utilization of property should be equally administered by everyone who has some marginal association with it, whether it's the employee or what. I don't think that that's true. I just don't. And then the other problem is what? How much equal bargaining power should the consumers have? You know, you have your worker with ten ten guys in it who make, I don't know, shovels, you know, what what say do customers have? That's never really addressed either. So, holy moly, an hour long. I'm going to wait a couple hours before I post this video. But uh, I think that, that that is another assumption that requires qualification on your part, as do many other parts of your argumentation. Um, I didn't really get into a comprehensive assault on democracy. I've mentioned a couple problems, as I did in the previous video. I'm glad you're thinking about them. Uh, please do so. I don't think you can take that for granted. And whoosh, that's it.